All right, good afternoon. Thank you for the invitation to talk today. Let me see if I can figure out this pointer and stuff. Um, I am going to talk to you more about PEDGE, which is a direct percutaneous endoscopic jejunostomy, and then the PEG with the jejunal extension tube. I didn't do an objective slide, so I'll tell you my objectives today are to talk about indications, technical considerations and challenges, and then potentially some uh, complications as well. Uh, I have no disclosures. Uh, enteral feeding has been shown to improve outcomes for patients, and this is in the way of decreased hospital length of stay, in, in a decreased risk of infection, and a decreased risk of organ failure. And Dr. Ponsky, who very nicely explained all of this to us this morning, 40 year, years ago gave us a nice endoscopic approach to give people feeding access uh, and to really expand our ability to do that for patients, but what if a PEG isn't enough? And that does happen quite often, and that's where we're going to talk about some indications for jejunal extension or jejunal feeding tubes. And this will be in patients with um, so gastroparesis or motility disorders who may need to have some palliation by decompression of their stomach or patients with some gastric outlet obstruction or SMA syndrome. It can also be very useful in patients with chronic pancreatitis. There's good evidence that post-pyloric feeding for chronic pancreatitis will decrease days in the hospital annually as well as the use of opioid pain medication. Other evidence for post-pyloric feeds it's kind of variable. There's um, not been shown to decrease mortality, but there tends to be a trend for decreased risk of aspiration and reflux. And there are definitely patients who are going to benefit from post-pyloric feeding. Uh, and go back a little so we can talk about the way of doing this, which you heard earlier is a jejunal extension through tube through the PEG or an actual direct percutaneous jejunostomy. I'm going to get into each of these a little bit more. Um, the jejunal extension tubes are small and floppy, and they tend to have complications related to this. They're usually 8 to 12 French in diameter and can be as long as 90 centimeters. They are placed directly through the peg tube and, um, and then pulled or dragged or pushed or however you want to get them past the pylorus into the jejunum to provide that post-pyloric feeding. They tend to have a lot of tube dysfunction because of their size and floppiness, and they can be quite challenging to place um, because of this as well. And to to get over some of those challenges, there are single-piece uh, gastrojejunostomy tubes that are also used as pegs. These GJ tubes are molded jejunostomy tubes into the gastrostomy tube. They usually have a balloon retention um, or a retention balloon for the internally, and then an external bolster, and will look very similar to other pegs that you've seen, except that they're longer. And then beyond the balloon, there's going to be gastric decompression ports, and then beyond that, the longer tube that has feeding um, holes so that you can decompress the stomach and feed distally with these. Uh, these are usually bigger usually a little bit stiffer, so you have a little fewer complications as far as tube clogging because of the larger diameter and then a little less of this problem where the tube likes to run around and go crazy and get in, come into the stomach. And we don't want this. We want them to be well-behaved and stay. Um, but to get a dog to do that, it takes a lot of patience and training, and to get a tube to do that, it takes a lot of patience and training. Um, so some challenges and techniques to try and help us through this um, is really that training and practice, um, having tools and, and techniques and thinking ahead as you're planning this. So when you're doing your safe track technique for your peg, 
think ahead and decide, is this patient potentially going to need a jejunal extension? If they are, you might want to consider, and similar to the question that was asked earlier, placing the tube more distally in the stomach in the antrum. This can shorten the distance between your gastrostomy and your pylorus, and then it can also straighten that angle so that your tube doesn't have to go in way up in the body, loop around a giant distended stomach, and then through the pylorus and, and distally, because that's just going to make it go crazy and swing back into the stomach again. Um, so you can straighten that angle also so you don't have a nice, a big, or a acute 90 degree angle for it to travel either, but kind of think ahead as you're doing your safe track technique to place that peg. Knowing and being used to and having available a variety of endoscopes, we've heard about using different sizes, pediatric colonoscopes, uh, gastroscopes, XP scopes, so that you can use those to aid yourself in these techniques, and then also having a variety and being comfortable with a variety, uh, a number of stiff wires will help with this too. I think uh, there's a theme here that stiffer is better. Um, and a stiff drink is probably helpful because it does take a lot of patients' expertise and practice has is, is been a recurring theme with these jejunostomy tubes. So some technical um, helpful hints, I guess, are using a guide wire. We've, some of these things are going to be a little repetitive, but I'm going to go into it in a little more detail. Uh, the guide wire, classic guide wire technique is going to be putting the guide wire through the pre-placed peg tube. And that peg can be in place already or you can do it at the same time. If you're doing it at the same time as your peg, placing these jejunal extensions actually is very minimal manipulation of the fresh gastrostomy and it's safe to do. You're going to put this wire through the peg, have an endoscope uh, intubated through the esophagus into the stomach, either snare or grab or do whatever you want to get a hold of that wire and then kind of drag it with your scope through the pylorus into the jejunum. And now the challenging part is withdrawing your scope and leaving the wire where you want it to be. So one way around this is through the snare technique. There's a link here which you should have access to but with a nice video of this, but I'll try to describe it as well. I'm basically going to put a snare through the peg, open that snare, intubate your esophagus and stomach with your endoscope, drive your endoscope through the open snare. So you're kind of snaring your scope and you can try it a few times and make sure you have it. And then drive your scope through the pylorus, down through the jejunum as far as you want to get your tube. You're going to place a wire through the working channel of the endoscope and then withdraw your scope leaving the wire in place. It's a lot easier than trying to withdraw the scope next to a wire and keep it in place. And once you get into the stomach, you would draw your scope out of the snare. You can then snare the, two, the wire and pull the one end out of the gastrostomy. So you have a wire going through your peg tube and straight into the pylorus and down. And then you can you either use fluoroscopy or other adjuncts if you have it or need it, and then watch that tube um, go right over the wire down to where you want it to go. Some other helpful tips. You heard about this endoclip technique. Um, again, you can buy these tubes that have sutures on them. Otherwise, you can make them very easily. Again, I use a silk suture as well. Tie a knot in it, make a loop. That goes through the peg. Your scope goes into the stomach with a clip. You grab the suture with a clip, drag it down beyond the pylorus where you want to keep it, and then clip the mucosa with the suture to hold that in place. Something that I do a little bit differently than what was described before is I'll clip that one in place, I'll remove that clip me mechanism and replace, put another one in. Use a second clip to grab the suture and the mucosa. Don't fire it. I hold that in place on tension as I withdraw my scope. And then that kind of helps to hold the tube where I want it as I'm withdrawing the scope alongside it. And then I'll fire that one and I'll have two clips there and a little bit of help keeping that tube in place. Uh, we did also hear about the kind of trans peg endoscopy using a small caliber scope, or you can dilate the, um, the gastrocutaneous fistula to put a larger scope through if you have a need for it. You can then pass that scope directly into the stomach through the pylorus and put a wire and pass your uh, tube over that. So beyond the jejunal extension tubes, 
to get rid of some of these complications of the tube migration and the clogging, the other option that we are discussing is this direct percutaneous endoscopic jejunostomy. This is a very challenging procedure. I'd say more even than trying to keep a jejunostomy extension in place because access to the jejunum outs beyond the ligament of trites and then finding a safe track is quite difficult, especially in patients with native anatomy. And you, you can imagine colon and mesentery and omentum and all of the organs that are between the jejunum and the abdominal wall. You have a much higher risk of complication in patients with thick abdominal walls and there is some predictive ability for failure for that. The success rate for the PEDGE itself is anywhere between 68 to 100 percent, which is quite different from 93 percent for the, the PEG-JET or the PEG-J. Um, and this is much higher in patients that have had previous upper GI or foregut surgery. And you can see based on these pictures why that might be. Uh, trying to get your scope in around past the ligament of trite, tri excuse me, find an opening there for a PEDGE versus getting into a RU limb, especially in an anticholic um, RU and having direct access there, is also through the gastrojejunostomy is a much shorter and straighter shot, so there's a much higher success rate for patients that have had previous upper GI surgery, and this can be uh, very useful for this. Other indications for your PEG that we haven't talked about are patients that have had total gastrectomy. You don't have a stomach to put a PEG into. Uh, PEG is an option for sure. Subtotals and, and other foregut. Um, or in patients who simply can't tolerate a, gast a gastrostomy, or maybe they have one and for some reason a, a extension tube won't work for them either. You can even use... Um, a tube through your peg to get into the jejunum and do a pedge that way, have two tubes. Other adjuncts that can help um, here are going to be having you know, multiple scopes and wires and all of your tools, as you know. The double balloon enteroscopy can be very useful, especially in the native anatomy. Uh, here's an illustration of how that could help you. Um, and then fluoroscopy and other imaging that you'll hear about later. Um, uh, also understanding to try and prevent complications and be successful for this, understanding your patient's anatomy is very helpful, whether it's someone who's had previous surgery or someone who's got native for uh, regular foregut anatomy, knowing where their colon is, how big their liver is, as Dr. Fong was talking about, to, to try and be successful, maybe predict where your PEG is going to be in the anterior abdominal wall. Being prepared by prepping the entire abdominal wall so that you're not surprised and outside of your prep zone, um, and then understanding any post-surgical anatomy that you might run into. This is a patient who had had a redo, redo, redo gastric bypass and has drains intraluminal and extraluminal. And um, if you see, there's like one little window where you might be, get, be able to get this done between her liver and her uh, ribs. But, and so understanding this anatomy, actually having imaging and, under, and operative reports are going to help prevent complications for that. Other complications of the PEDGE um, that we talked about specifically, I know there's a question coming up about volvulus, and there is definitely a higher rate, <laughs> preemptive, <laughs> higher rate of volvulus with um, the PEDGE, and it it's probably comes down to mobility of the jejunum, which is something that's hard to treat preemptively, um, and so it has a higher risk, and you, there's very little that I know of that you can do to prevent it, so... Uh, any questions?